Welcome to Inside Chips, the podcast that keeps you up to speed on the fast-moving world of semiconductors. I'm your host, Gregory Haley, Technology Editor with Semiconductor Engineering, and every week we'll bring you the breakthroughs, the deals, and the science shaping the chip industry. Let's start this week with tariffs. On Thursday, the Trump administration dropped its Liberation Day reciprocal tariff package. Now, semiconductors and copper were technically exempt in this package, which might sound like good news, but that exemption could be short-lived, and semiconductor tools and equipment weren't mentioned at all. That's leaving the door open for confusion, or worse, disruption. Add in Europe and Asia's looming retaliatory tariffs and rising costs for auto and consumer electronics, and we're looking at some ripple effects across our entire supply chain. To manage incoming investments and CHIPS Act funding, the administration also announced a new entity, the United States Investment Accelerator, housed in the Department of Commerce, designed to fast-track investments over a billion dollars. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, Europe is going all in on chiplets. IMEC, in partnership with the state of Baden-Württemberg in Germany, just launched the Advanced Chip Design Accelerator, focused on automotive innovation using chiplets, advanced packaging, AI, and system integration. Also, the research fab Microelectronics Germany and Fraunhofer IIS rolled out a new chiplet application hub, which aims to be a central platform for chiplet development across use cases. Over at Intel's Vision event this week, the company's new CEO, Lip Bhutan, and his team have wasted no time in laying out a focused agenda for the company. First up, Intel is planning to divest some non-core businesses, though there are no details on that just yet. More importantly, the Intel 18 angstrom process has entered risk production, with external tape-outs underway and volume manufacturing planned for late 2025. The message, Intel is getting more engineer-focused and more customer-centric. They're also leaning into custom x86 chips designed for specialized workloads. In San Francisco this week, at OFC 2025, we saw a flood of announcements. ASC showed off a co-packaged optics device mounting multiple optical engines on a substrate, achieving under 5 picojoules per bit. Teradyne introduced the first high-volume, double-sided wafer probe test cell for silicon photonics. Keysight, NTT, and Lumentum hit 448 gigabytes per second using 224GBOD PAM4. Lightmatter revealed both a 3D photonic interposer and a 3D co-packaged optics product. AlphaWave brought its 224GB PAM4 Surtees, 6TB IO chiplets, and UCIE D2D IP subsystem and IMEC built and tested a 144 GHz photonic code division radar system. Now let's do a deeper dive into what's happening in the news today. I'd like to welcome Ed Sperling, the founder and editor-in-chief of Semiconductor Engineering, onto the podcast today. Hi, Ed. How are you doing? Hi, Greg. Good to be here. Thanks. Terrific. Uh, looking at the headlines in the news this week, um, there's some pretty big stuff. Of course, start with what's on the topic of everyone's mind today, the tariffs that Trump announced yesterday and how that might affect the semiconductor industry. Well, I think the big problem right now is we don't really know. There were some exclusions in terms of semiconductors and also some of the materials that are not uh, produced in the U.S. or were supposedly exempt, but there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding this. I don't think we're going to have a clear answer until possibly several months from now when we actually see how this is going to affect the industry. Let's take a look at what's happening in quantum computing this week. Uh, What's going on over at DARPA? Well, DARPA introduced its quantum benchmarking initiative. There's been a lot of concern about quantum computing, particularly from the standpoint of the ability to use it for cracking ciphers and uh, breaking breaking into uh, different devices that can can run uh, ciphers at amazing speeds. They're just mind blowing, and that's that whole uh, duality of is it a, a, a one or is it a zero? And sometimes it's both. The ability to do that and be able to do it at close to absolute zero opens up a whole bunch of different opportunities as well, some of which include things like superconducting materials. So, DARPA named a whole bunch of companies. I think there's about 15 on the list at this point. Uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprises in there, IBM's in there. Uh, Synopsys is joining up with uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise and, and actually HP Labs 
to uh, really get into uh, underpinnings of uh, how do you develop these uh, computers and the chips. Yeah, as quantum comes uh, becomes more of a reality, there's certainly opportunity for improvements in everything from uh, medicine to materials, but there's also the dangers, of course, of its ability to break into just about any encryption. There's some news coming out of Europe this week as well about their new focus on chiplets. Chiplets are going to be big, especially for the automotive industry, because rather than developing a five nanometer chip or a three nanometer chip, they can develop a three nanometer chiplet, which is much less expensive. They've got to figure the yield is going to be higher on a single chiplet than it will be on a an SOC or a fully integrated uh, multi uh, die package. And as a result of that, they should be able to cut costs. So the focus of the whole industry, the whole automotive industry on chiplets is going to be huge. And a lot of that is coming out of Europe. Yeah, that's a really interesting point about being able to create greater value out of three to five smaller chips that are known good die as opposed to trying to squeeze them all onto one massive um, system on chip. And possibly even up to 100 of these different chiplets in a, in a complex system. You're going to see the automakers start adding in uh, what they can do in software right now. They can actually do in chiplets as well in, in terms of here's a new function that you can use. Here's a uh, way of uh, uh, customizing this in a very uh, fairly inexpensive way because they basically set up a chassis for putting these chiplets in. Moving on to what's happening uh, with Intel. It looks like Lip Bhutan is already making some pretty important moves over there. Well, the fact that their 18A is on track and now in risk production is interesting. Another one that I thought was interesting was the ability to uh, create customized x86. Now, what that actually means, I'm not quite sure, but it's no longer just you get an x86 and this is the chip that you get. It's now, hey, we can build this specifically for you and we're going to design it so that it's going to be competitive with everything else out there. Right. It's, uh, it certainly is a change to the way they've done business in the past and might open some opportunities for uh, other companies to get into the D, uh, the EUV and some of the higher end nodes if they're able to contract some of that technology out. We're seeing a lot of this kind of customization roll out in the industry these days. One of the other significant ones that I can point to is uh, Samsung Custom HBM. Uh, they've been developing that for customers. And then you've got uh, ARM has been doing a lot of uh, um, development on putting putting together modules. Uh, so some of this stuff is going to be packaged up in ways that we hadn't seen before. Yeah, you, know, you got you got to figure about fifty percent of the most advanced chips that are being developed these days are being developed by systems companies, and almost all of them are customized. This is just a way of getting that customization out into the market. There's some interesting news happening in the optical world as well. The photonics are certainly taking on a bigger role in the chip industry. I think the big news that I saw came last week when NVIDIA rolled out a giant optical switch inside its GPU. You're going to see a lot more of that simply because it, almost every problem that uh, designers are running into these days is thermally related. Uh, moving data is going to at high speeds and moving it uh, uh, just massive amounts of data generates a fair amount of heat. Optical is a way around that. Now it has to be built into the, a lot of the chips that are out there. And a lot of this is going to be done in packages and potentially between packages and between chips. Yeah, that's fascinating. And certainly it's going to uh, improve speed as well, but it's going to give mask makers a whole new headache. Thanks, Ed. Here are a few more headlines from this week. ML Commons released its latest inference benchmark results. It's always worth a scan if you're in AI hardware. 75 startups raised a combined $2 billion this quarter, with funding concentrated in artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and data center communications. And there's a growing focus on chip and system security, particularly where automotive safety overlaps with cyber risk. In global news, here's what's happened in Asia. UMC opened its new 22 nanometer fab in Singapore. Production kicks off in 2026. Hitachi High Tech launched a new etch facility in Kudamatsu City, Japan. Rapidus received funding approval for its two nanometer pilot line, now underway. And Form Factor is expanding its Taiwan probe card center. In Europe, Arteris opened an engineering hub in Poland to develop NOC IP and system-on-chip automation tools. 
CEI Litai released its 2025 scientific report, 116 pages of dense but essential reading on neuromorphic in-memory chiplet interconnects and more. The EU is also backing Photon Hub Factory with 15 million euros to boost photonics innovation. For deeper dives, this week's Automotive Security and Pervasive Computing newsletter at Semiconductor Engineering features an article on the auto industry's role in pushing IC security forward, new challenges for aerospace and defense chips, and how chip aging is opening new security vulnerabilities. Plus, we have new stories on startup funding, multi-die assembly, and the push for known good die testing. Head over to semiengineering.com to check out the full lineup. In markets and money, Qualcomm acquired Movian AI, a Vietnam-based Gen AI lab. IBM Intel inked a five-year R&D deal for small nodes and chiplets. ST Micro and InnoScience partnered on Gallium Nitride Tech. AMD completed its $4.9 billion acquisition of ZT Systems. Black Semiconductor bought applied nanolayers for its graphene IP. And Siemens snapped up Dotmatix and partnered with Accenture on industrial AI. In funding highlights, ISMOS raised $22 million for power devices. Retim emerged from stealth with $75 million for, for programmable DSPs. Attitude got $50 million for terahertz interconnects. Infinilink raised $10 million for optical chiplets. And Flux, Lumi, and GS Microelectronics all closed new rounds. Yo also projects that panel-level packaging market will quadruple to over $600 million by 2030. In People Moves, Casey Eng is now president of Tata's Semiconductor Division in India, and Dr. Craig Child is the new director of the Chips for America EUV Accelerator in Albany, New York. In education and training news, the European Chips Skills Academy has opened applications for its 2025 summer school, and Princeton University launched the New Jersey AI Hub for Applied AI and Ethical Research, blending training, R&D, and social impact. In security news, the Cherry Alliance released the open source Sunburst chip, accelerating Chariot adoption. DARPA tapped Cerebrus and Renovus for a next generation high performance computing platform. MITRE weighed in with a new RFI response on domestic chip security. Research highlights include threat modeling with large language models, hardware vulnerability detection, silence pre processing techniques, and TLS key protection via HSMs. Also, CISA issued new advisories on the fast flux threat, exploiting gaps in network defenses. We have some product news this week. Keysight introduced a suite of tools to validate AI clusters from Phi to App Layer using real world workloads. Cadence launched new E USB 2v2 Phi IP for TSMC's N3P process. Infineon debuted its DTO247 package and High Cycle Power Profit Plus switches for EVs. And Ansys got its ESD tools certified for TSMC's N2 node with full cloud-based platform support. All right, let's wrap up this week with the coolest part of the week, our research breakthroughs. Fraunhofer developed a way to integrate lower tier satellites into 5G networks, even if they can't act as full base stations. Baker Hughes simulated a 2.2 billion cell axial turbine using ANSYS Fluent and over a thousand AMD GPUs on the Oak Ridge XSL supercomputer, setting a new world record for supercomputing. Caltech discovered a new supercomputing state in atomically thin iron-based materials. Harvard built a photon router that could enable superconducting quantum networks and a bilayer device for manipulating polarized light. Columbia used self-assembling DNA scaffolding to assemble nanometer scale 3D electronics. The Korea Institute for Science and Technology created infrared upconversion nanoparticles that can emit full color visible light. It's great for anti-counterfeiting or ultrafine display tech. Researchers at Livermore, Harvard, and Penn invented 3D color responsive materials using coaxial inkjet printing. Think smart textiles or robotic skins. 
And finally, UC Berkeley unveiled a tiny wireless flying robot that spins and lifts using only magnetic fields. It's super lightweight, wireless, and packed with potential. And that's a wrap on Inside Chips for the week of April 4th, 2025. From tariff drama and chiplet momentum to the bleeding edge of optical interconnects and AI research, this industry never stands still. If you want to dig deeper, head over to semiengineering.com for all the articles we mentioned today and subscribe to our newsletter while you're there. I'm Gregory Haley. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you next week with more